Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon and good evening wherever you are. I am delighted to welcome you to the premiere of our Connect to Earth Global Health Talks today on World Health Day. The theme for this year's World Health Day is building a fairer and healthier world and it couldn't be more apt given what the world has just gone through with COVID-19. Our guest today is Dr. Peter Dajak, a zoologist and president of the EcoHealth Alliance. Dr. Dajak was among the international team of scientists who traveled to Wuhan to study the origins of the virus that causes COVID-19. He will share his views with us today about the report that was published last Tuesday. My name is Alice Rueza and I am the Africa Region Director at WWF International. And I'm Marco Vollmer, Executive Director Communications of WWF Germany. The Connect to Earth Global Health Talks are designed as a digital platform for exchange of global health topics and the connections between pandemics of global diseases and the protection of nature. Exchange of knowledge and ideas between scientists, members from civil societies, NGOs and other exponents around the globe. We want to learn, engage and discuss what are the impacts and consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. Our topic of today, preventing pandemics with global nature protection. Let's have a look at a short video. The effects of the pandemic are easy to see, but what about the causes? No, not them, the real causes and drivers. Do you think of us and our broken relationship with nature? Deforestation over exploitation. Clearing the land for agriculture and livestock. Overproduction, overconsumption, illegal consumption. Our long list of unsustainable actions. When we destroy nature and take over natural habitats, we break the healthy balance and boundaries of the natural world. Forcing wildlife into closer contact with each other, our livestock and people. And all this makes it easier for diseases to spread between animals and to us. When and how we will emerge from COVID-19 isn't clear, but one thing is the risk of future pandemics will only increase unless we fix our broken relationship with nature. Thank you. Let me say more about our guest today. Dr. Peter Dajak is a British zoologist researcher and expert on disease ecology, in particular on zoonosis and in the cause and spread of zoonotic disease outbreaks like that of COVID-19, Ebola, Nipah virus and other zoonoses. Zoonoses are diseases transmitted from animals to humans. Dr. Daja currently serves as the president of the EcoHealth Alliance, a non-profit government organization that supports various programs on global health and pandemic prevention with headquarters in New York City. Peter was essentially involved in the IPBES pandemics report, escaping the era of pandemics. IPBES stands for, you might know this, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. It is the intergovernmental body which assesses the state of the biodiversity and of the ecosystem services it provides to society in response to requests from decision makers. In January, Desek, as my colleague um, Elliot already has said, um, Peter was part of the team of scientists who were tasked by the WHO with finding out from where the SARS-CoV-2 virus originated. Last week, they published their highly anticipated report. Okay, so Dr. Dajak, let's go back to the beginning. How and why did the SARS-CoV-2 virus emerge? Well, we don't know the exact circumstances yet, but um, what we do know is that viruses like sars coronavirus and SARS-CoV-2 um, come from wildlife. They originate in wildlife. And, and in those species that they've uh, evolved in, they're quite stable. They've been there for millions of years, probably, circulating within those populations. And what happens is we make contact with those species and the virus gives an opportunity to get into our uh, bodies and spread. Now, this happens every day around the world. 
And every now and again, we come across a virus that, that does this very well, that can spread in our populations very well. The problem is, on the planet, if we create this unprecedented interface between animals and people, like we do when we cut down forests, build roads into remote areas, um, set up mining systems, extraction industry, um, wildlife trade, um, Ill illegal activities involving animals like pangolins, for instance, we've heard about, um, or, or uh, there's just this over-exploitation of, of aggressive expansion of agriculture. We allow viruses to get into our populations at an unprecedented rate. And that's why we're seeing more and more pandemics. And what we think happened with SARS-CoV-2 is exactly that. Um, we created an opportunity for a new virus to get into humans for the first time and spread. And here we are now in the middle of this pandemic. Peter, as we all know, the history of pandemics is long. On this graphic here, we see that the Spanish flu, for example, killed 40 to 50 million people. HIV AIDS, 25 to 30 million people. Do we humans not want to learn from those pandemic events in the past, or are we basically helpless to prevent such pandemics at all? Yeah, when, when you see it laid out like that, it, it's, it's so, so obvious that these things are going to happen in the future. Um, almost every one of the viruses you just talked about um, has um, a connection with animals. Um, so it, it's all about our connection and what we do to the planet that allows them to emerge. And we're actually seeing an increased rate of, of diseases emerging. They're, they're accelerating just because we're also accelerating our impact on the planet. We've got um, unprecedented levels of road building, of deforestation, of agricultural expansion, intensification, illegal wildlife trade. Um, we're setting up the perfect conditions for pandemics. And I think one of the problems is we, we've got a tendency to rely on medical technology. We think there'll always be a vaccine, there'll always be a drug. And what we saw with COVID-19 is there wasn't a vaccine. And it took over a year to get the vaccines developed and rolled out, even, that, even though that was the quickest ever. In that year, we saw people die, we saw our neighbors get sick and die, and we saw the global economy crash. We cannot sustain this level of, of, um, of impact from pandemics. We're going to have to do things differently. Um, Dr. Dajak, as we have just had, you were a member of the WHO delegation that has been investigating the origins of the virus. Tell us more about this. What was the aim of the mission? Well, the mission was a joint effort between the WHO, the World Health Organization, and um, China, one of the member states of the WHO. So um, we set up to go to Wuhan, meet with Chinese scientists who've been working to try and understand the origins of this virus for the last year, and find out what they know, discuss what the data they present to us means, and come to conclusions about the most likely pathway that the virus took. And we looked at four pathways. We looked at a virus emerging directly from animals to people, a virus that went through an intermediate host. We remember from SARS that it went into civets and then spread in the wildlife markets and got into people. And we also looked at whether this could be a, a virus that, that emerged through frozen or chilled food, because that's been seen in other outbreaks, or whether it came out of a lab, because that's a widely put out hypothesis. What we found is the most likely scenario and there is evidence growing for this, is that it emerged from wildlife, probably bats, got into um, an intermediate host, um, and maybe in the wildlife farms that were set up over the last three decades or so across Southeast Asia, across South China, to supply food to the markets. And when we talk about food, we're talking about live mammals, wild animals like civets, raccoon dogs, ferret badgers, that are a very popular meal in Southeast Asia, and that is are now being produced at an industrial scale and shipped around. Now, to the, to the credit of China, they closed down those wildlife markets at the height of the outbreak, recognizing the public health threat. But the, the wildlife trade is still alive and well in many, many countries. The illegal wildlife trade is increasing at an unprecedented rate. There is an inherent risk to our health through those activities. We think that may have been what was involved in the origin of SARS-CoV-2, we know it was involved in the origin of SARS and many, many other pandemics. We need to really address this issue urgently. 
We fully agree, Peter. And given China's initial response to the outbreak and the fact that it took a full year to get a joint Chinese and international team on the ground for a brief visit, the critical but challenging search for clues faced skepticism from the start on. How was your personal impression during your stay in Wuhan? How did the Chinese government treat you and your colleagues? Well, of course, at that point, we, we, we were on a diplomatic mission at, at some level, so we were treated very well, of course. Um, I think that the, the problem we have is that this issue has become politicized. Um, with, a, with a pandemic of this scale, some countries haven't done well in the way they've handled the pandemic and are looking for someone or a group of people or an issue to blame for this. And I think people all around the world have, have got a sense of loss of control over their own lives, and they're looking for something to blame. So, of course, people start to point at where did this come from? What did they do wrong? But I think we have to really look at this objectively and, and ignore the politics, put them to one side and say, what is the real issue here? If we're going to point the finger at anything, anyone, any group of people, we should point it directly at ourselves. These activities that drive pandemics are driven by our overconsumption of, of products and goods on the planet. Uh, and, you know, we, I think that's a positive thing. That means we can all play a role in this and do something about our footprint. Now, in, in the Wuhan work that we did around this WHO mission, um, the China side presented us with new evidence that's never been seen before. We laid it out in a report which is many hundreds of pages long with lots of detailed results in there that point to um, a, a, a disease that emerged probably in the last part of 2019 that seemed to have been an explosive outbreak in the city of Wuhan that definitely still has a link to those um, markets that sold live animals um, and then spread globally. So there are some really significant clues and leads for future work And it's important to point out that this WHO mission is phase one. Uh, and now we need to move on and continue the work and dig in deeper on some of those leads and really try and nail down this for the sake of history, why this pandemic emerged, how, so we can stop it in the future. Um, I'd like to dig deeper a little bit on, onto those findings. Um, so according to the report, obviously you've just mentioned there was no verified reports of live mammals being sold at the Hunan market, and none of the frozen animals tested are positive. And furthermore, the report says it was extremely unlikely that the virus came from a lab. And now you say you think the likely cause was illegal wildlife trade. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, we know that um, the farms in China were supplying these markets with um, mammals, animals like raccoon dogs and ferret badgers and civets, which we know can carry coronaviruses. They've been doing that for the last two, three decades. It's completely legal at the time. Um, we, we know that frozen products, I mean, by the time the, the, um, the authorities went into the Huanan seafood market, it was closed. They closed it out for the sake of public health and cleaned it out. Most of the live animals had gone. Um, but what, what the re uh, researchers did find is live mammals in fro uh, sorry frozen mammals in the freezers that were left behind and in those freezers there were also some of these mammals that we know can carry coronaviruses so we don't know if live mammals were being sold there it may have been legal it may have been illegal what we do know is that in many markets around china and southeast asia these animals are sold we know that there's a history of them being sold there and we know there are frozen products there Even though they tested negative, what it points to is a pathway. It points to that there was a, a viable pathway into that market. And when you look at the supply chain, it came from the areas of South China where the nearest related viruses are found. So there's a direct link there between the wild and the city of Wuhan. And I think what's really striking to many people outside China who, who haven't seen these markets before is that Even in a very modern city, very technologically advanced city like Wuhan, we're still having this very old-fashioned um, uh, sort of culturally uh, appreciated activity of eating wildlife, buying them live in markets right in the middle of a city. It's a very high-risk activity. China recognizes it. We all recognize that as scientists. We now need to 
do something about it on a global scale. Uh, just to, to, to ask again, or to ask, uh, uh, to ask another question on, on that issue. So would you say that um, uh, you, oh, you say and you, 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 you are noting in the report that uh, uh, further study on these farms is needed, no? in these livestock farms in Southeast Asia. Uh, what are your hypotheses on that? Well, what we think may have happened is that, uh, you know, bats carry these viruses in the wild and have done for millions of years, um, harmlessly to them, we think. Um, but when you put farms with very dense populations of species like civets or ferret badgers in rural areas where these bats live, all it takes is a bat to fly over and contaminate those animals for an infection to spark off. We saw exactly this in Europe recently where COVID-infected people um, coughed onto um, animals in mink farms and the virus took off and started killing mink. It also mutated while it was doing that. And there's a real risk that that can happen and, and lead to an outbreak. So we think that's the sort of thing that happened there. And then these animals were imported into a market or people who got infected there brought it into a market. Once a virus takes off in a different species and it's successful, like SARS-CoV-2, it's really hard to contain. And that seems to be what's happened. Um, the only way to stop that is to deal with the interface between wildlife and people and reduce it. So we minimize the opportunity for these viruses to spill over from wildlife into humans. Thanks, Peter. And you, you, so you've You've identified that, that, that the illegal wildlife trade is a possible source. I think the report also talks about, you know, the wildlife farms being provided, you know, a perfect conduit. Um, and I know that while the inquiry has been considered by many to have been useful, the report does leave many unanswered questions. Oh, yeah. uh, we also, I mean, there appears to be uh, some questions about how the virus spread to humans or if it even originated in China. And we've also read that scientists had difficulty accessing raw data. So it sounds obvious, have you just said that more research is needed? Can you tell us what the next step will be? Is it to try well, and carry out more research? Yeah, please, please tell us that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the good news is, you know, despite the reports in the media about access to data, we got access to data. Um, the other good news is that China signed off on this report. It's a consensus report, it's a joint study between WHO and China. The Chinese scientists um, signed off on further studies. So that needs to happen now. And those further studies are laid out in the recommendations in the report. They include going down to these wildlife farms, interviewing the owners, testing people in the area to see if there were COVID cases there. We'll still see the antibodies present. Further work on wildlife, not just bats in China, which we know carry similar viruses, but all across the Southeast Asian region where other viruses are being found almost on a monthly basis that are close to SARS-CoV-2. There's a whole series of further work that needs to be done on the epidemiology, trying to trace back the first people that got infected to see if we can find evidence of it beginning somewhere else, perhaps, or if it really did begin in Wuhan. But we do think there is the, the, the wildlife um, to intermediate host to humans is the pathway that the virus likely took we considered that likely to very likely, and others were far less um, less uh, probable. There's there's no more there's uh, much more work to to be done. But can you understand and can you uh, uh, can you see that critics say um, you see only some elements and only a partial side? And how do you answer these critics? Well, you know, we saw a lot of information. I mean, we looked at. Um, data from um, human testing uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, um, excess mortality, undiagnosed pneumonia and influenza-like disease going back two, three years. And we look for patterns. And, you know, smart scientists can find patterns in all of the data that we were shown. And what we found were no patterns of earlier spread. We think that this really did uh, begin in late 2019 and there was no evidence of significant transmission prior to December, an explosive outbreak in Wuhan. We saw evidence of a likely animal pathway, which everyone was looking for. How could a virus get from um, remote rural areas into a city a thousand miles away? Well, there's a pathway, the conduit through the wildlife trade. Um, and we saw um, evidence of 
things that have happened many times before in pandemics. So there are data available. This work is possible. We can do it even one year after the outbreak, even two, three years after. We can still understand a lot. Let's not forget that very many outbreaks have happened and very few have been traced back to the first ever human case. But we do know why they begin. And we've done that by piecing together the history of those outbreaks. What we're dealing with in SARS-CoV-2 is a history that's only one year old. It's, it's very easy to do. The work is achievable. And the future will lead to, I think, a real understanding of what happened. But nevertheless, we have to see that there is a political dimension on this yeah. scientist's trip and uh, a, the, there has been criticism from the United States and answers from uh, the from the Chinese government. Uh, what are you answering uh, and how do you feel uh, in between these uh, world politics questions? Yeah, it's true. It's, it's a real, um, it was really striking. I mean, I've been working in China with the people we were talking to in many cases for the past 15 years. And I've never had a group of reporters following me around in the field work we do. And what we had there was an incredible um, focus of attention from, from the world on what we were going to find. Um, and that's because of the politics. And I don't think the politics really help. I understand why they're there. I understand that people want answers to this because we've got a sense of, you know, we, we've lost control of our own lives. But the politics in, in this pandemic within countries and across the world have not really been helpful. Fighting over whether to wear a mask or not, fighting over whether to take a vaccine or not, fighting over whether a lab was the origin or not, fighting over whether we should be allowed in to investigate or not. These things are not useful. Um, we need to follow science and science has the answers. It's had the answers all along to whether we should wear a mask, whether we should do social distancing, and it will have the answers to where the origins of this virus began. Um, and we really look forward to doing continued scientific work, despite the politics, to understand that. Thank you for your open words, uh, Peter. And as I said at the beginning, this Connect to Earth Global Health Talks uh, is designed to be an interactive platform where we also want to integrate uh, questions um, of our communities. And uh, um, I would uh, uh, give you a uh, couple of questions uh, which we have already received via our community channels uh, or other communities we have um, approached to. And um, uh, for example, um, uh, I we're starting with the first question. Um, is, there, um, is there a connection between COVID-19 and other pandemics before, writes Dancing Duck? Yeah, look, um, you're, you're exactly right. There, there is a connection. Um, and, and the connection is, is, if we look at the patterns of past pandemics, look at HIV. We know that HIV had its origins in a virus that was infecting chimpanzees and emerged through bushmeat hunting. Bushmeat hunting in Africa had increased um, uh, to a level that was unprecedented, never been seen before with increasing population. We know that people came into the region as part of a war that was being fought at the time of the origins, and maybe that was part of the driver. We know that then the virus spread through global travel and then became um, ingrained in our populations globally. It's a, um, an interface between animals and people that drove it to emerge and then spread through our globalized populations. It's the exact same process over and over and over again. So yes, there is a very strong connection. There are other questions coming out of the community uh, um, with regard to our food system. Um, for example, we have here, uh, and I will I will give you some questions to the same uh, to the <clears> same <throat> issue. Uh, Inge Kaiser will know um, or ask uh, to know um, what does our food system and our consumption have to do with the outbreak of the pandemic? First question. There's another one. Let's say people would go vegetarian or vegan. Would this help in any way to prevent zoonotic diseases? And maybe not. Uh, third one um, we have here, would a change in dietary within the society help prevent future pandemics caused by zoonotic diseases? Well, I, I love these questions because you know that that's highly controversial to say uh, becoming vegan or vegetarian would reduce zoonotics. But it's it's a fact. You know, what we're seeing with, with, um, with these diseases are um, diseases directly related to our consumption of animals around the world. Now, 
you don't have to be a vegan to avoid pandemics. You can still eat meat. We can still have the production of animals for food, but we need to do it in a way that reduces the risk of pandemics. We need to start taking these risks very seriously and testing animals that are part of this food production system um, for not just known pathogens, but pathogens that could be future zoonotic diseases. And for some of the very, uh, some of the species that we know have a potential to carry viruses that could affect us, we can just take those out of the food chain entirely if, if possible. So I, I really do think that, that we need to look seriously at our, at our diets and our consumption patterns, not just of food, but also of products that are related to animals. For instance, fur. Um, the fur trade includes animals like raccoon dogs, which we know carry coronaviruses, which we know are farmed in dense populations across Asia. And um, similarly, mink. We, we saw that in the Netherlands and Denmark that, that mink carry COVID. So reducing consumption of food like this and, and animal products will reduce the risk of pandemics. And I, and I urge everyone just to think about your own diet and, and think about reducing some of those animal products. You don't have to cut them out entirely. Just start by reducing them. You're doing something good for the planet, for biodiversity, for climate change, and your, for your own health because you're, re you're reducing pandemic risk. This answers also this question here, um, uh, uh, what you have said so far. What is the most important requirement from a biodiversity point of view in order to be able to better prevent pandemics? And I would add another question. What can we learn from nature, Peter? What would be your answer on this question? Yeah, <clears throat> well, that second question is interesting. Nature is nature can be very cruel and, you know, animals um, themselves have pandemic diseases that emerge and cause death. Um, so we can learn from that. We can learn from what's going on in nature and we can look at patterns of, of these diseases in nature and say something is happening, um, not just within our own populations, but also across wildlife and plant diseases too. And these are all related back when we look at this in a big picture perspective to our own activities. Um, globalized trade is it has an inherent risk of spreading the parasites and pathogens that are linked to those products. So that's part of it. And I think what we can do ourselves when we look at the, um, the drivers of pandemics is think about our own ecological footprint. And look, protecting biodiversity to the first question, um, protecting biodiversity will reduce the risk of pandemics. Keeping biodiversity intact, ecosystems whole and healthy will reduce the risk of pathogens getting into our own population. It's also beneficial to our own mental health to see these wonderful places. I think that's something that COVID taught us. As, as many countries went into lockdown early on in the pandemic, we recognized that the real need to get out into nature and we saw what we were missing. We also saw wildlife populations bouncing back in many places where we had this global pause and reduction of pollution, and reduction of travel and trade that, that allowed wildlife to bounce back a little bit. It gives us a glimpse of a possible future where we still engage in our activities that we, we need to prosper, but we do them in a smarter way that allows wildlife to persist, that protects biodiversity, reduces climate change and benefits our own health. Thank you for your open uh, answers uh, to these questions coming out of our communities. Um, Alice, now we would like to go to our next part and to, think, to, to say and to talk about how can we prevent of pandemics? Yes, indeed. How can we prevent um, future pandemics? So, um, Peter, as you know, more than 500 million vaccine shots have so far been given worldwide. And um, as of 15th March, about 23.6 million vaccines have reached us here in <clears throat> Africa, and that is just only 1.7% of the population. And uh, we are actually hearing that widespread vaccination here in Africa will only be achieved in 2023 or 2024. So the question on everyone's mind is how can we prevent future pandemics? I know you've captured some of that, but anything to add there, how can we truly prevent oh, future such pandemics? A, such a difficult, complex problem and what you've what you've just hit hit the nail on the head with is why are we so unequal around the world in the way we deal with our own health it's it's not good to do this because viruses don't 
check our passports before they infect us. They don't. They don't think, um, you know, this person is a different ethnicity or religion or wealth or belief system or political system. They just infect us. They look at us equally. We need to think like a virus to defeat these viruses. Uh, and the reason I say this is because if big parts of the world remain um, relatively unvaccinated, all of the countries that are wealthy that have kept the vaccines to themselves will, um, will then be at risk because the virus will continue to circulate. It will continue to evolve and it will be pushed to evolve to escape the vaccines. And then everybody is at risk again. So it is short-sighted not to engage in, in equity around global health. That's number one. The, the other issues we need to think about for preventing future, uh, future pandemics are, well, what is out there that could emerge? And I find it incredible that for all of these big global threats that we know about, earthquakes, tsunamis, hurricanes, typhoons, terrorism, we have the incredible surveillance systems, um, weather satellites, um, you know, listening to phone conversations around the world to check for global terrorist attacks. And, and, and defeat them before they begin even. We don't do that with pandemics. And I think we need to start taking this seriously. We need a surveillance system that's global, that looks, number one, at what, is avail what, what viruses are found out there in nature that could em emerge in the future, that looks for the very earliest signs of new diseases. So many diseases go undiagnosed, especially in countries that don't have as much resources, money, to do the healthcare work on the ground. It's to the benefit of the richer countries, again, to share wealth and help poorer countries do, do a, a, a more um, um, comprehensive job of checking every disease that emerges. Because once a disease emerges, it will spread through air travel and trade, <clears throat> and it will affect the richer countries straight, straight away. So we really need to start taking these seriously. Peter, I would like to read um, a quotation from you um, and uh, here uh, we have it what worries me the most is that we are going to miss the next emerging disease that we are suddenly going to find a SARS virus that moves from one part of the planet to another wiping out people as it moves along this quotation you have not said yesterday or after your visit uh, uh, to Wuhan you have made this quotation in 2004 so it is quite a couple of years ago. Um, what would you say are the governmental leaders not listening to scientists? Well, look, we did miss it. <clears throat> we, we missed a, a new disease exactly like SARS, really. If it, if it did emerge through those wildlife farms, it's the same thing as SARS. It's very closely related and it, and it causes a similar symptom. And we missed it because we weren't doing enough. We need 10 times the effort on the ground to find these viruses, to find these early cases, and to block the transmission at a very early stage. This isn't about um, politics or about openness and transparency of whether a country reports quickly or not. It's about real effort to take pandemics seriously. And, and you know, that, that comment that I made in 2004, the sad thing about it is it's valid right now today. We still aren't protected. I, I believe that right now, we, we estimate um, over a million people a year are infected by these new coronaviruses that are coming from bats because of the unprecedented, um, you know, explosive footprint in the region where these viruses exist. So it's happening right now. There's probably somebody right now today um, just been exposed to one of these viruses and may be beginning the first cough of a new um, coronavirus infection. What are we doing differently today that, that's going to stop that spreading? I don't think we've really taken this seriously yet. It needs to happen. Speaking about speaking of taking uh, the pandemic seriously, 24 world leaders, including the head of the WHO, have called for a pandemic treaty to foster an all of government and all of society approach, strengthening national and regional and global capacities and resilience to future pandemics. How, in your view, would such a treaty uh, work? And what do you think it would look like? Well, I think that the devil is in the details. I, of course, everyone supports doing something differently in the future. And a pandemic treaty 
that governments sign on to is really important, but it needs to be taken seriously. We've already seen in the past, um, the WHO has the international health regulations that countries have signed on to, and then the minute a disease emerges, have ignored the details of. So we need a treaty where there, there is uh, both a carrot and a stick if a country doesn't move along with, with, the, um, with the agreements that are in that treaty. And we also need a treaty that thinks about what's causing all of this, because any doctor knows you don't just treat the symptoms, you try and get to the underlying cause and prevent that happening again. So if the, if the symptoms are pandemics and the cause are things like wildlife trade, deforestation, unprecedented overconsumption and agricultural intensification expansion, what are we going to do about that? And that goes way beyond the pandemic treaty. This is something where we really need to look at global consumption patterns from a climate change, biodiversity and health point of view. It's making us sick. It's making our planet sick. And this is something we really need to grasp. Peter, I wonder whether there is a country which shows progress in the implementation of measures to prevent future pandemics. Could you let us know about what you think here? Well, no one country is doing this perfectly, but there are the beginnings of efforts underway. So we see um, some countries in Europe that are beginning to look at proactive measures to, um, to understand what's out there, to try and prevent uh, future diseases emerging. Countries are doing segments of that, little portions of the work that needs to be done. And different countries are doing that in different ways. But we really need to take this seriously. We call this a one health problem. Um, it includes the health of humans, the environment and animals. And we need to look at that as one thing together. Some countries have one health programs and it isn't always the richer countries that do this best. Bangladesh, Malaysia, they have one health programs where they're trying to, um, when there's an outbreak, they send teams of ecologists and veterinarians to understand what's going on, not just medics. So all countries need to do this. All countries need to come together around those those um, efforts to bring health of everything, of the, the wildlife, of, of animals, of people together in a One Health framework. No, great, very good points, Peter. Um, so speaking of, uh, you, you yourself actually just said that preventing, um, that protecting biodiversity will reduce pandemics. And in October, we are heading to the Global Biodiversity Summit where we are going to be are putting in place a new post-2020 biodiversity framework. What is your expectation of that from that summit now as we are coming out of COVID-19? Well, I, I'm really hoping that people will recognize at the COP the, the um, connections, the connectivity between what we do to the planet and the emergence of pandemics. It's crystal clear from the scientific point of view. Um, we know that that's the driver. Um, so let's do something about it. So recognizing the connection is number one. Then the second step is to actually enact uh, procedures and rules that will reduce that risk. Um, there are triple benefits to everything we do to reduce the, the um, overconsumption on the planet. It, it benefits biodiversity conservation, all the ecosystem services that come with that. It reduces climate change and it saves us from these pandemics. And when you think of the the incredible impact, both economically and in terms of mortality and morbidity from, from COVID, surely that's something that's well worth addressing um, aggressively this time round. Mm. And what would you say, what role could and do world leaders play and how can we all make sure this issue is at the top of their list of priorities? Yeah, it's, it's really challenging for a, for a politician, a world leader, Anybody who relies on people to vote them in to step up and say, we need to prevent this because it, it's not as heroic um, and, and it doesn't win you votes when you when you're trying to, you know, reduce global trade um, that, that affects people's livelihoods. Um, when you compare that to heroically moving in when there's a pandemic crisis to deal with that crisis. And this is the problem we're in, is that we, we do well in, in the way we respond to crises. We had a global lockdown. We've got all these economic recovery plans, vaccine rollout at an unprecedented rate. But we do a very poor job of prevention. So my message to policymakers in general, 
and world leaders is that, you know, the public understand these connections now and they will buy and, and believe in a prevention message. And I think that that's something really important. Uh, what, what you're talking about is not allowing something like COVID to happen again in the future. That is a message the public will really appreciate. And they're willing to sacrifice a little bit to do that. And that's all we need to begin with, just a little bit of sacrifice, a little bit of reducing um, our over overconsumption on the planet, increasing our sustainability. Look at the youth, gener the youth movement around um, climate change. And let's think about why that's happening. People are sick and tired of hearing the news that every year is the hottest year on the planet. Um, we're going to see pandemics emerging every decade, um, every few years now, and that's going to increase over time. So let's get there before it happens and stop them. Thank you very much. And maybe, maybe one last one. At an individual level, what should we do? We, well, me, think, you, me, yes, go ahead. Sorry. Well, look, yeah. I, I think this is really something important that I feel very strongly about. Um, mm -hmm. Every day we make choices that affect pandemic risk. We just don't know it. We don't realize the connection. So when we go to the um, supermarket and buy food, we're making a decision on where did that food come from? Is it part of a globalized system of food production and, and transfer that we know has driven diseases in the past that's not good for climate change, that's not good for biodiversity? Um, so let's make a choice to buy local. Let's make a choice to reduce some of the high risk or, or, um, or more harmful parts of our consumption patterns, whether that's fur or, um, or uh, meat products um, or products from intensive farming or products from deforestation. We've seen incredible focus around palm oil, but let's look beyond that and think about um, the, the unsustainability of everyday items that we buy um, and that we promote by buying them. Let's think about the impact of our consumption something we can all do every day. Thank you very much, Dr. Dajak. I, I can't sum up how rich this conversation really has been. And I think really the big takeaways would be, you've told us that science has the answers and we must continue following the science. You've also talked, said that data are available, that even one year after you went to Wuhan, you were able to find some data that you were able to draw some conclusions from. And you've also made it clear there is a clear pathway, you know, with wildlife trade that leads us to this disease. And, you know, you told us about biodiversity protection and the importance of that in preventing pandemics. And uh, really, you've called on our political leaders to really take this seriously in terms of preventing these future pandemics and the fact that it's a one health problem. And really, finally, on us as individuals to make to look carefully at the decisions that we make and whether it's about consumption and buy, whether we need to buy local. And, and lastly, you know, you've also recognized the potential of the youth movement and the, and the need for us to look at that. So thank you so much for your time today. And I would I would say thank you also um, for uh, your tendency here. I think we have learned a lot. And what I take away is that uh, the work just has begun. Yeah, I think uh, we just start uh, for the next step on the global world politics level, but also on private level that each of one that everyone uh, can uh, support uh, the protection of biodiversity and can prevent uh, and can can contribute to prevent pandemics. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Peter Deshek, for joining us. My pleasure. And thank you, thank you to you all for you. what you're doing. Thank you. And thank you to all our listeners. Uh, goodbye. Uh, take care and stay healthy. Bye.